Across the country, ordinary Americans from all walks of life are taking whatever measures necessary to prepare. We're preparing for a series of terrorist attacks on the nuclear facilities of this country. For the Yellowstone supervolcano. Civil unrest following a dirty bomb blast. And protect themselves. Oh, yeah! From what they perceive is the fast approaching end of the world as we know it. Next, we go into the lives of three committed preppers who face a unique challenge. Preppers tend to prefer remote locations, rural tracts of land far from other people, and the chaos they fear will erupt after an apocalyptic event. For them, metropolitan areas are simply too volatile, too loaded with dangerous variables. But what happens when you live and prep in the middle of America's most densely populated city? In Brooklyn, Cameron Moore, a college student studying for medical school, spends the time he's not in class worrying about nuclear disaster. I'm preparing for a meltdown at the Indian Point nuclear facility. Uptown in Harlem, Margaret Ling fears an act of nature will destroy the city she grew up in. I'm preparing for a catastrophic hurricane. Downtown on Wall Street, Jay, a bond trader who vividly remembers the day the World Trade Center towers fell is bracing for New York to be hit again. I'm preparing for another terrorist attack. Regardless of what form their doomsday takes, all three of these preppers believe they'll face the same challenge. You only have so many bridges leaving New York City. You're talking about trying to get 8 million people out of the city, 30 million in the region. The mayhem, the panic. Mass hysteria and the city will be out of control. It'll be every man for himself at a certain point. A complete evacuation of Manhattan has never been attempted. If any large-scale disaster struck the city, these preppers fear it might be impossible. The city's fragile system of bridges and tunnels could become flooded, jammed, or shut down within hours leaving millions trapped on a 23-square-mile island without access to food, fresh water, or electricity. That's why, for these three New York preppers, at the first sign of trouble, survival comes down to one objective. Get out of New York City. Leaving Manhattan as soon as possible. Grab my bag and just jet out. They've also paired with a mentor to help them refine their plan. Krav Maga instructor Matan Gavish preparedness expert, Eitan Edwards, and urban survivalist, Shane Hobel. Now, over the course of one night, all three preppers will put their bug out plans into action for the first time, an attempt to escape New York. August of 2011, and again in October of 2012, New Yorkers faced an unthinkable possibility, a direct hit from a hurricane. With Manhattan sitting only five feet above sea level at points, and experts warning the storm surge could rise up to 15 feet, 370,000 New Yorkers suddenly faced the possibility that their homes would be destroyed and their lives endangered. For Margaret Ling, who recently moved to New York City from Florida, rising waters and panic remind her of 2005, when she was trapped in her home during Hurricane Katrina. I lived through it, and I don't want to live through it again and feel vulnerable. Currently, there is a 1 in 75 chance that a major hurricane will hit the region in any given year. A disastrous hurricane hitting the city would just be horrific, and it will knock out power. It's happened before. So Margaret lives every day, all day, with hundreds of dollars of survival supplies literally strapped to her back. Every day, I make sure I carry a bag or a backpack with me. It's part of my training. Hurricane warnings are usually issued days before landfall, but a last minute change in direction or wind strength could leave Margaret with only a few hours notice. If a storm is coming, Margaret doesn't plan to follow FEMA instructions and stay inside. She'll use the window of opportunity to escape. I know I don't want to be sent to a shelter. 
I plan to get out of the city and make my way up to the mountains in upstate New York, close to Canada. The last and worst case scenario is walking the entire distance to safety up in the mountains. Margaret feels confident she can physically withstand a long journey on foot. But her greatest fear isn't running out of energy. It's that she'll be vulnerable to attacks from desperate people who might take her for an easy target. As a woman, you're more likely to be victimized, so I want to be able to fend for myself. Margaret isn't confident she's prepared for an apocalyptic street fight, so she's turning to Matan Gavish, a Krav Maga expert who teaches the official no-holds-barred defense system of the Israeli army. Prepping for disasters, especially catastrophic storms, I want to know how to defend myself when people go ballistic on each other. Okay, well, you come to the right place to prepare for violence. According to the principles of Krav Maga, avoiding a fight is always the first and best form of self-defense. Before she learns to attack, Matan believes Margaret must first learn to preempt a confrontation by making herself invisible. If you have to first dress a lot less conspicuous, you will attract a lot of bad attention with this type of outfit. Do you have something more comfortable, less conspicuous you can put on? Definitely. Is that your bag? Yes, it is. All right, let's open it up and see what's inside. Antibacterial wipes, the trowel. Okay. In case I have to do my business, in case I have to tread through water, I have a bathing suit. This is a nice little device. A hand saw, in case I have to build anything. I can take down lumber and start sawing. Up to three years of sales service, not even a tenth of that. You can probably lower this bag by half. The bigger the bag, the more attention you will get to yourself trying to get out of an urban environment. People will want what's in that bag. And if you'll be able to learn how to use your environment to provide for you, then a lot of these things will become uh, just added weight. Right. You'll be able to do Practically everything that you can do with this, with something like this. Without much, I can just, you know, put it in my pocket, and that's it. I'm not attracting any attention to myself. So right now, I might not look like I'm carrying anything of value on me or anything that could sub for a self-defense tool, but I have not just one, but actually three of these great tools. I do carry a knife on me every day also. Matan wants Margaret to understand that if she pulls out her knife, she must be ready to use it within seconds. If she hesitates, a stronger opponent could take it and use it against her. It takes a certain kind of individual to be able to drive a knife into a person. It's not the same as punching a person, and it's not the same as even shooting a person. Driving a knife into another human being requires a certain uh, amount of, of evil inside of you. Now, do you think you'll be able to drive a knife into someone's heart? I don't want to say no. I don't want to say yes. As an alternative, Matan has offered to show Margaret how some innocent-looking items in her bag can double as weapons. My favorite item from all this is right here, the lollipop. You close that up, this doesn't move anywhere. It's not this part striking into any soft tissue into, in the body, the eyes, the cheeks, cut right through the blood and air vessels into the throat, get it in and out, in and out, in and out. As you strike, you can cause a lot of damage with this lollipop. Very deadly. Tonight, Matan is going to coach Margaret through a test run of her plan to escape New York in advance of a deadly hurricane. Margaret looks like a tough girl. From everything I've seen today, I think she will be able to do it. She's not gonna break, she's been preparing for this, but we're gonna put her through some sticky situations, absolutely. In 2012, some of Margaret's worst fears were realized as Hurricane Sandy sent cars floating down Wall Street, submerged roadways on either side of the island, and flooded some subway tunnels from tracks to ceiling. So she and Matan are plotting a 14-mile bug-out route on foot. She's decided to walk through the parks at the center of the island towards the city's highest elevations near the George Washington Bridge. You ready to do it? I'll wait. Let's go. All right. All right. To train for a worst case scenario, they'll start from Battery Park City, the farthest point on the island from Margaret's destination and the lowest elevation point in the city. 
right, Margaret. We have 14 miles to go north. You ready to do it? Let's go. Let's go. The clock has started on Margaret's journey. But while she's taking care to avoid the water's edge, college student Cameron Moore is plotting to use the water to his advantage if a nuclear accident makes New York uninhabitable. But his attempt to bug out by sea could be more deadly than the apocalypse he fears. These three New York City preppers are convinced the city they love faces imminent destruction. They fear a hurricane, a terrorist attack, or in the case of student Cameron Moore, a nuclear accident that will destroy New York and cripple the global economy. Cameron grew up traveling the world. As a teenager, he took humanitarian missions to India, Gabon, and the Amazon. Now, at the age of 23, he's made a life for himself in the concrete jungle of New York. I live in New York because it's New York. It's a beautiful, dirty place. <laughs> but if the Indian Point nuclear facility, which sits 35 miles north of the city, suffers a meltdown, Cameron fears New York would quickly become deadly. The official plan is to open up welcome centers, which are essentially detention centers. I mean, you saw what happened in Katrina. You go into there, it's martial law, people get killed and raped in those centers, and you can't leave, you have no individual freedom. The Indian Point Power nuclear reactor has over 1,500 tons of radioactive waste. Theoretically, anything above a 6.0 earthquake would cause damage. And you know, just last year here in New York City, we had a 5.2. Just imagine how much of those isotopes will get, would get into your body in the event of even a minor spill. When Indian Point was built more than 40 years ago, engineers did not know it rested on the intersection of active seismic zones. If an earthquake caused a meltdown at Indian Point, it could force the evacuation of nearly 20 million people. Millions of people dying is almost the low end of the impact. If New York City goes down, the United States economy goes down, the global economy goes down, and we have a serious worldwide problem that needs to be dealt with. When hits the fan, I will bug out. As a young beginning prepper, Cameron feels he needs a mentor to get him ready. Right. We need to get you out of here, over to here, and then across from here. So he's reached out for help from Eitan Edwards, head of the International Preparedness Network, and a prepper for more than 25 years. Eitan is kind of a, a versatile preparedness expert. Uh, he knows a, a little bit of everything and a lot about some things. He can be intense. You're not going to want to stay in Brooklyn. You're not going to want to stay in the peak injury zone. So if you can get out of the peak injury area in time before the crowds make, then you have a greater chance of survival without uh, you know, being irradiated, glowing in the dark. <laughs> it's cool to glow in the dark, but it's not very fun with the side effects that come along with it. If the Indian Point nuclear reactor suffers a meltdown, Cameron believes he will only have five hours before radiation hits the city. Cameron will avoid the waterfront nearer his home at the Brooklyn Bridge because the currents there are three times stronger and he risks being taken out to sea. He's planning to cut across Manhattan for speed and cross the Hudson River to the mainland of New Jersey. The shortest distance between two points is what? Straight line. There you go. When we get to the other side of Manhattan, we got to get across the Hudson River. That's where we're going to get creative. All right? You ready for that? I'm ready. Tonight, Aton will put Cameron through a dry run of his plan in the middle of the night. Yo, Cam, what's up? Get up, man. You got to go. Cell phone use in the United States increased 100% after the 9-11 attacks. Aton expects that number to explode and calls to be impossible if Indian Point melts down. So he's equipped Cameron with a walkie-talkie to keep by his bedside. What's the situation? The situation is critical. Get up, get rolling, and meet me in the park as quickly as you can. Take the fire escape. Don't take the stairs. There's too many people coming down at once. They're getting jammed up. You read? All right, copy that. situation like this, you've got to do the right things. You've got to carry the right things. You've got to know where you're going. You've got to know how to get there. What's up, man? Ah, you made it. 
Well, let's see what you got so I can get you ready to get out of here as quickly as you can. What kind I got of ID? ID. I, I got my passport. I got my social security card. Passport is considered to be about like the top grade ID. You're going to be able to move through checkpoints easier with that kind of an ID. What about your potassium iodate or iodide? Because you'd need that if you were to come in across with any inhale that particulate. One of the first things that it can do is it attack the thyroid. So you want to have a thyroid blocker in there as well. The only thing, brothers, is you know that anything that you leave, you've left. Because in a serious radiological emergency, chances are you're not going to get back to that area to get it ever again. So recognize what you have in that bag is the last of whatever you left in that apartment. Everything that's in that apartment is going to be a museum at that point, a museum of uh, what we shouldn't do ever again. Let's roll out. Cameron's initial plan was to complete his 13-mile journey on foot, a challenge for a non-athlete. After an hour on the street, fatigue is setting in. By biking, Aton expends up to five times less energy than Cameron on foot. Now he wants to see if Cameron has the adaptability and moral flexibility he considers necessary to change his situation. This is like uh, quite a bit before we get to the Brooklyn Bridge. Now I have an idea. If you're ready to go along with it, I think we're going to have to go and find a bicycle because there's really no way that you're going to be able to last much longer at this pace. I got the tools. I got the way. If you got the will, let's make it happen. You know I got the will. All right, then let's do it then. Ah, chain's too thick. Too thick. We need something quick, man. Quick and fast. What about hey, look this at this one, one right here. Many preppers' bug out bags contain food, water, and a weapon. Aton's bag contains bolt cutters, which can cut through industrial strength locks. You know what? Right now, we've got to get out of the city. So it's a matter of survival. Unfortunately, sometimes the decisions that you have to make when you want to survive are pretty harsh. But this is the reality of the situation. Cameron is a principled guy, and I think that he would hesitate. Unf unfortunately, it's a kind of a thing where you say, he who hesitates or she who hesitates is lost. A man is dying. Or, um, and his, his wife breaks into a pharmacy because she can't afford the medication and steals the medicine. Is she morally right? Stealing a bicycle to save your life or someone else's life is uh, certainly acceptable. <laughs> it was something I would consider. While Cameron is picking up speed, downtown on Wall Street, a third New York prepper is getting ready for a different kind of apocalypse. For Jay, who asked we conceal his last name for professional reasons, Doomsday already happened once in his lifetime. He vividly remembers being in Manhattan on September 11th, 2001. Experiencing the, the attacks of September 11th, it's just horrifying. It also makes you really aware how vulnerable you are. And of course, my first thoughts are, is this happening? Is it gonna continue to happening? And where's my family? Jay's working on a plan to protect his family from more terrorist attacks. But the stress of reliving his worst nightmare may be more than he can handle. Tonight, three preppers are on a simultaneous bug out. Margaret Ling, who is learning to fight for her life without a rule book. Pre-med student Cameron Moore, who must choose between helping others and saving himself. And Jay, who fears any hesitation after a terrorist attack might mean he'll never see his family again. When it came to the terrorist attacks in New York City, the big problem was just the total confusion and the realization of the horror of, are we really going through this? Or is this just some type of surrealistic nightmare that's happening? No event in recent history shattered American sense of safety more than the terrorist attacks of 9-11. For a number of Americans, like Jay, it was the major catalyst to start prepping. I don't think it's gonna end. I don't think that we're gonna wake up all of a sudden one day and all of a sudden we're not gonna be a target to terrorists around the world. A dirty bomb is without question an option for terrorists out there. If a dirty bomb containing conventional explosives and radioactive material were detonated in the middle of Manhattan, hundreds could die immediately, with more casualties possible in the aftermath. Jay fears that if millions of New Yorkers tried to flee the radiation, 
they'd find the city's bridges and tunnels incapable of handling a mass exodus. Those without a concept of what to do and where to go and what their first step should be are way behind the game. Jay has spent around $5,000 assembling a cache of supplies kept in his home in the place he thinks he's most likely to be during the next attack. The attack during 1993 and certainly September 11th were during business hours and business days. So if indeed I had to bug out of my office and get uptown, I thought it'd be prudent that I have a well-stocked bug out bag. If terrorists detonate dirty bombs across Manhattan, as Jay fears, he has instructed his wife, Mindy, and their six-year-old daughter to get ready to flee the city. On September 11th, 2001, the city's bridges and tunnels were shut down 36 minutes after the attacks. So if Jay is at work, he believes he must be able to get home to his family as soon as possible, or they must be ready to leave without him. My daughter, she thinks it's a game to a certain extent. I try to make it a game. Escape New York will make it fun. But Jay doesn't believe his white collar job in finance has set him up with physical skills he needs to meet his family and get out of New York as quickly as possible. So recently, he started giving up weekends to train with Shane Hobel, an expert who teaches urban survival classes in Central Park. I just started working with a gentleman who's become a mentor, learning about various urban tactics and things one should watch out for and look for when you're in a big city like Manhattan. Let's pull up the map. OK. And let's take a look at a path of travel between this place, this mm -hmm. work site, and your family. We want to get to your family immediately, right? right. This is the objective. Exactly. Right? To get to them and then to do the bug out from that point forward. Right. Have you ever done this walk before? I had to take this walk once before, right after 9-11. Wow. You know, at that point, you know, the, the, the city was in a absolute pandemonium, and, uh, and it was very chaotic. So we just hoofed it right uptown. Right. Why don't we take a look at what you have in your go bag. OK. And uh, see what you're carrying, see the weight of it. OK. And, uh, and let's go from there. Let's take a look at what we got. I've got a rain poncho. I have a fire starter, communication so I can get in touch with my wife. First aid kit, pry bar, in case things get tough to get out. Very good. So looking at this and the amount of weight from which it's carrying, you know, there's some stuff in here we can probably lighten up on. Shane believes there is one item in Jay's bag that weighs less than a quarter pound, but which could help him meet almost all his survival needs and replace many of the heavier items in his bag. I'm going to show you what to do, you know, with one of these when you don't have any of this stuff. Shane and Jay are plotting a way to escape his office in Lower Manhattan and head for a secret rendezvous point in the Upper East Side, where his wife and daughter will be waiting. From there, the family will make their way out of Manhattan into Queens, and then to the Hamptons at the tip of Long Island, where they have established a safe house in an undisclosed location. I try to explain to my daughter, you know, the idea of the terrorist attack. Life's not, whoa, one big playground. If a dirty bomb attack happens, Shane doesn't believe Jay should walk a straight line to his family, as there could be radioactive elements drifting across the city. So his first lesson is a method that will help guide Jay home. So now the first thing we need to double check here is one trick, the wind, right? Mm -hmm. We're dealing with an airborne situation, potential mm -hmm. uh, hazard there. So one thing we can do is just at street level, at our level, you know, we're checking the wind. Obviously, we've got some wind coming in from that direction, and we blow it out, and we notice where the smoke is. It's heading in that direction. Mm -hmm. If Jay is able to pinpoint the location of the dirty bomb explosion, Shane recommends he test the movement of the air and then walk into the wind. This will give him the greatest chance of getting the airborne hazard behind him as quickly as possible. By paying attention to all the little telltales, such as that as trees, banners, flags, high wire cables, any of the, uh, the window rigging stuff, anything that would indicate movement of the wind, that's going to help guide us through the city. So in this example, we would immediately cross the street, have that wind towards our face, allowing that hazard to be blowing behind us, and then we would move. So throughout the course of tonight, mm -hmm. this is something we have to pay attention to at all times. Let's do this.
If, as Jay fears, Lower Manhattan is filled with toxic smoke when he emerges from his office, he may need to drink as much water as possible to help his body rehydrate and keep him moving towards his goal. But if stores are shut down after a terrorist attack, the only available water might be sitting in places like this, a fountain exposed to the elements and often played in by children. Shane believes Jay needs the skills to make even the dirty parts of the city his lifeline. I'm gonna show you a little trick about filtering water on the fly. So, let's see what we got here. Okay, let's see that bandana yes. of yours. So we're gonna take this charcoal. It's just clean charcoal from a campfire, mm -hmm. all right? No chemicals, nothing else involved. So we're assuming that the wind has been blowing in our favor, that it hasn't affected this area, including this water source. Mm -hmm. So the same bandana is now going to help us filter this water. Here's the trick. We can't use these large pieces of charcoal. It's not gonna filter anything. Mm -hmm. The water is simply gonna run in and around in all of this stuff. We need to make this absolutely powder, like confection sugar. And so, pound this up. See that beautiful dust that's coming out? Mm -hmm. That's what we want. Because if it's coming out of the bandana, well, I know that it's gonna be pretty pulverized inside this bandana. As the fountain water is poured over the charcoal, chlorine, sediment, and other substances that would make it undrinkable chemically bind to the charcoal and are removed. Shane recommends every prepper carry charcoal in their bug out bag for an easy, inexpensive, and effective water filter. Let's do this. <sighs> Feels good to hydrate, huh? Tasty. Yeah, huh? Let's go. This is not just a journey of getting to his family, but the truth is it's a discovery, a journey to himself and understanding where the strength lies within. All three New York City preppers are now on the move. Before the night is over, Jay will find out if he has the physical stamina necessary to be his family's hero. Cameron will learn to sacrifice his desire to help people and strike if necessary. And Margaret is about to discover that dropping one's guard in a doomsday situation can be fatal. Over the course of one night, three New York City preppers are putting their bug out plans to the test and attempting to escape the island of Manhattan. Now, their mentors are about to spring their biggest challenges. You always want to be aware. People usually get into trouble when they're in parks at night. During Hurricane Sandy, water surged a record 13 feet to flood areas on both sides of the island. So Margaret believes her best choice is to walk through the center of the city, including parks that she fears could become hotbeds for conflict. This is what I was talking about earlier. When I was talking about awareness. You want to see violence before it begins. These two guys, I don't like the way they behave. It's going to get violent. It's better for us to just go around it, not get anywhere near it. Let's just get out of here, OK? OK, come on only engage in violence if you cannot avoid the situation. Mm -hmm. By 4 a.m., Matan and Margaret have walked six miles and reached the base of Central Park. In her scenario, gale force winds could be roaring, waters may have already risen on either side of Manhattan, and she fears Central Park may be one of the only dry land masses left. Here, without her knowledge, Matan is about to test how prepared she is to defend herself. This is your test. I want you to meet me at the most northern part of the park. Right. I'm gonna let you go now. Good luck, and I'll see you on the other side. Matan is watching Margaret to see if she employs awareness strategies. Keep her head up, scan back and forth, focus on the whole scene, not get tunnel vision for only what is in front of her, and be aware of what lies ahead and behind. Margaret, what went wrong? I didn't pay enough attention during my route. Not enough awareness? Right. 
Did you see the one person coming behind I you? I saw one. I heard him. I was trying to avoid him. I heard the footsteps, but I was not aware there was a second guy. When we're dealing with attackers, we can never assume there is only one person. But also when you were grabbed, you froze. You started wrestling out, but there were no strikes. There was no marking into soft points. There were none of the stuff that will actually get you to take down a bigger, stronger assailant. So let's take out the lollipop. All right. If this is the only thing that's on you, you should already be prepared. You're walking in a dark park in the middle of the night by yourself. You should have something ready to go. You were caught from behind in a bear hug. All right, from here, you attempted to try to wrestle him off of you. Bad idea. Drop your weight, shift your hips, grab the groin, grab, grab, grab. The second you get that distance, that's where the lollipop comes in. Turn around, hammer fist cross right into the throat, lollipop. Puncture the throat, the eyes, the throat, the face, <clears throat> only into soft tissues. Strike, <clears throat> work on the soft point, <clears throat> dig it into the ear, into the eyes, get out of there. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Now let's have you do it. You get grabbed from behind, drop your weight down, the other side, open palm to the groin, elbow to the body. Good. Now, hammer fist, keep working. Lollipop goes only to soft points. Left hand strike, right hand strikes, working on all the soft points, getting him out, push him off, and out of there. Out, 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 out. Good. So you see how easy it was for you to move and strike and get away without that big bag weighing you down? You don't need all that equipment. All you need is a good instrument to stab with. Could be your lollipop, could be a knife, and a bottle of water. That is it. And when you're walking through Manhattan at night, it's not the big storm you have to worry about. It's the flock of crazy people that are gonna try to put their hands on you. I just have to spend more time and be put more work into being in the gym and practice. One assailant, two assailant, fighting off, fending off three, four people at one time. It's just something I have to do to be prepared. Despite her setback in the park and being an hour behind her goal, Margaret wants to see her bug out through to the end. She will continue on through Harlem and towards her destination at the George Washington Bridge. Further downtown, Eitan and Cameron are just arriving at the base of the Brooklyn Bridge. Cameron fears by now, two hours into his journey, panic will have set in for people on the island. So before they get to Manhattan, Eitan's showing Cameron his favorite tool for disabling assailants. In New York, people fight. The problem with that is, is that in an emergency like this, you can't afford to get into a physical conflict because of a lot of different reasons, one of which is that you don't have the time and the energy or the inclination. You're trying to get out. You're not trying to fight and prove that you're Mike Tyson. What I would suggest is something that you can use to spray or attack somebody, because if you try to fight with your fist, a lot of energy is lost. So you know what I like? I like to carry stuff like this. You know what this is? You wouldn't believe it. <laughs> bear detergent, huh? Yeah, man, bear deterrent. Yeah, you know what it is? This is mace for, like, animals. <laughs> Aton carries bear repellent instead of pepper spray, typically used for defense against human attackers. The two have the same ingredients, and both cause debilitating pain and blindness. But because bear spray is formulated to take down adult grizzlies, it is more potent, shoots farther, and can incapacitate multiple human attackers. Now, if you aimed and fired this in somebody's face, or if you aimed and fired this in the general direction of somebody, you'd wind up doing a lot of damage. To basically stun and run. What are you trying to do? Stun and run. Eitan wants to push Cameron to see if he has the mental and physical fortitude to survive an all-night escape from New York. But the next surprise he springs may push Cameron over the edge. Oh, man. As night is turning into day, three New York City preppers are in the midst of grueling tests of their survival skills to see if they'll have what it takes to escape New York's urban jungle when doomsday comes. By now, in a worst-case scenario, Margaret Ling fears up to 11% of Manhattan could be underwater. Jay has followed a meandering path to escape the dirty bomb debris he fears, but it has already taken him six hours to go from Wall Street to Midtown, with the most congested parts of the city still to go. And Cameron has crossed one of Manhattan's rivers and now has another mile to reach the Hudson. 
He fears that if nuclear fallout rains down on the city, this brief passage through Manhattan will be the most dangerous. He will need to cross a city packed with millions of panicked and potentially violent New Yorkers. Earlier in the night, Aton urged Cameron to steal a bicycle. Now, they'll both find out if Cameron is ready to pull the trigger on his own. I was raised Quaker. I believe in, you know, in pacifism, nonviolence. I'm against killing people. I would try to just stop them. Cam's got a lot of spirit, and I think Cam will fight. And then he'll worry about what he did later on. Can you see this? Uh, phone, Watch yourself. Man. Get a phone. Let him rage again. Get him back. Good shot. On the bike. Let's roll. Move out. Stun and run. Stun and run. Let's go. With Aton's help, Cameron proved he has the will to strike an assailant and keep moving. But he doesn't know the moral dilemmas he faced tonight were orchestrated by Aton. He also doesn't know that his biggest challenge is very real and just around the corner. This is where I'm going to break off from Cam pretty soon. He doesn't really know it, but he's got to kind of like stand on his own two feet at this point. And now we've come to the moment of truth. And that is, we've gotten to Manhattan, now we've got to get to New Jersey. And the only way to do that is to cross that river. While Cameron plans his river crossing, 50 blocks away, Jay and Shane have less than a mile left to go. This is also the last stop before they enter what many consider New York's most chaotic 14 blocks, Times Square. As he would in a real bug out after a terrorist attack, Jay will attempt to contact his wife before entering this final high risk stretch. He'll use a two way radio, which FEMA agents use themselves when they enter a catastrophe where phone lines may be jammed. Mindy, Mindy, this is Jay, over. I'm on Grandma's block. The car is packed and we're ready to go. Yeah, that's right, Grandma's house. I'll see you there soon. Love you guys. Good deal. You know, I just wanted to point out, we're out in the open right now, right? right? We've got plenty of trees across the street. Those banners, that street sign over there, mm -hmm. we're getting a change of the wind. So far, so good. We can feel it in our face. Right. That's a good advantage. That airborne threat, that dirty bomb is behind us. Uh -huh. We're in a good position. Let's head up north. Let's go. Up to 1.6 million people pass through Times Square every day. Shane worries that if crowds gather here after a terrorist attack, Jay may get hurt as he tries to push through to get to his family. He wants to show Jay that if he's injured, a natural field hospital stands just off Times Square and on his way home. So, this bandana, Hi. remember, we've been using for all along? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we can use this for first aid applications, splinting mm -hmm. uh, for... Uh, for any sort of slings, anything like that, compression bandages right here. On this field as it is, we've got plantain. You familiar with this plant? Absolutely. Yeah, it's an edible. Yes. You know that you can actually make this into an incredible antiseptic. If you get a cut, a laceration, any member of your family, mm -hmm. you grab this plant, make sure that it's clean. I could take some of this plant right now mm -hmm. and chew on it. I'm gonna get a nice pulp, mm -hmm. right? My saliva is activating this medicinal property place it right on the wound. I would take a brand new leaf of the same plant. You know, lay it right over the top of it as if it was the bandage. Take that bandana, just like any other bandage. Now I've got myself a field dressing. Plantain, it'll save your life. Jay's journey has taken him through the night. Now he will have to make one final push to see his family. For Margaret and Cameron, the moment of truth has also arrived. Each of them is about to hit their limits and face the final test that will determine if they have any hope of surviving Doomsday. A little help. Starting to drift. As the sun starts to rise, three New York City preppers are nearly off the island and away from the apocalyptic urban landscape they fear. Cameron has to get across the Hudson River. Margaret is determined to make it across the George Washington Bridge. And Jay must rendezvous with his family and complete the bug out to Long Island with them. Honey, we just arrived in the park. I should be there in a few minutes. Over. We're ready. Terrific. I'll see you soon. Let's head out this way. All right, there's a pond right down here. Clean yourself off. All right. You know, get yourself back together. Nice. Good job.
Well done. Great. You made this. Thank you. Good Thanks job. for all your help. I appreciate all you. I think he did a fantastic job. I think it was a big reality check in terms of what he needs to work on. But, you know, Jay's got a big heart. And he's got a huge objective, and that's his beautiful family. Well, the last leg of the journey was exhausting, to say the least. But I knew, ultimately, that my family was real close. And that's what kept me going. Going forward, I'm certainly going to continue with my basic prepping plans. All right, let's get out of here. But if it's something that's absolutely horrific in the end of times, post-apocalyptic nightmare, well, then it's most likely game over. I guess at that point, I'll make sure I have three bullets left. The Hamptons, at the tip of Long Island, are known as a playground for the rich and famous in summer months. But the house Jay's family has there isn't a weekend getaway. Jay believes most New Yorkers will travel west towards the mainland of New Jersey to escape dirty bomb debris. So he is making the opposite decision, to move east towards the ocean. Jay's bug out vehicle is not only equipped with all his family's supplies, but also three bicycles. So if the family encounters roadblocks along the way, they can abandon their car and still have a way to reach their safe house. As far as the safety of my family is concerned, there's pretty much nothing that I wouldn't do. I would certainly put my life on the line for theirs. On the other side of the city, Margaret is about to walk out of Manhattan and over the George Washington Bridge into New Jersey. With 14 lanes, the greatest carrying capacity of any bridge in the world, she believes it's best equipped to absorb the masses of panicked New Yorkers she fears will be attempting to flee the city with her. By now, Margaret is hours over her ideal escape window. In her scenario, the bridge would have already been shut down due to high winds, and waters would have risen several feet around the island. She would be trapped. All right, Margaret, yes. this is the end of the line for me. From here, you're on your own. Good luck. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Well, I didn't make it here at sunrise, but we did pause a few times, so I think that added more time to the journey. And since my guard was so down, because I thought, Matan will take care of everything, I kind of just let all that responsibility go. After tonight's experience, I'm definitely going to practice more evening walks. And I'm going to pray for peace, but prepare for war. 10 miles south of Margaret on the George Washington Bridge, the final leg of Cameron's escape from New York is also the most strenuous. He'll attempt to cross the Hudson River into New Jersey, cutting across an 8,500-foot stretch of water with currents that run both ways. The idea was to get Cam out and to get him into a safe area, then Cam is well on his way into getting out of the city and out of harm's way. All right, dude, you ready? I'm ready. I'm really proud of him, you know? Proud to have him as a friend, and I'm proud of just how he's been able to kind of move through all of this tonight. Hey, Todd. All right, Cam, do it, man. I'll see you there. He's good for the game. He's going to make a great doctor, but he would also have made a great Marine and a great soldier as well. In the event of an actual storm, I believe Margaret will be able to make her way out of New York City. She does have to keep working a lot on her self-defense skills. Overall, I think he's starting to get it. I think what he realizes is how far he has to dig deep to push himself physically and mentally, keeping the objective in mind. It's important to prepare. I don't think anyone can ever be prepared enough. Eitan showed me the way. I couldn't have done it without Eitan. If there ever is an India Point nuclear meltdown, I'll be able to find a way out, most likely make it to safety. The vast majority of people won't have that luxury. New Jersey, the promised land. Feeling exhilarated. Tired, but exhilarated. New York has seen a handful of significant hurricanes in the last 200 years. On average, experts predict that a major hurricane will hit the region every 74 years. 2012's Hurricane Sandy tested local emergency plans. Even as New York suffered tremendous damages, its citizens largely remained orderly. 
The Indian Point facility received top safety ratings in 2011 from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, but in 2012, it still needs to meet post-Fukushima safety standards, and many remain concerned. Because New York has faced terrorist attacks in the past, since 2001, the state has received more than $3 billion in federal homeland security funding, and New York City police officers currently carry thousands of radiation detectors.